you shot the whole mouse over your belly, you know it's right. Now. I'm going to be close so to the hour by the time we're down late, so then I should go ahead and just start. You know what they are. That's a good line. So we are over there. Morning, everybody. Welcome to our first seminar, our first educational seminar. Uh, I'm Jim Paulus with the Museum of Gaming History, and uh, we sponsor, put on these educational seminars. And I'm going to introduce Mr. Robert Baker, okay? And this is a little bit impromptu, but, but Bob's a good guy. <laughs> I've been dealing with Bob for a long time now on uh, submitting stuff that he puts up on Chip Guide. And you're all familiar with Chip Guide, right? Bob last night was uh, notified for it was presented last night at the banquet that Bob is the most prolific provider of images for chip guide. Thousands, tens of thousands of images have been put up by Bob. And in fact, last night at the uh, banquet, Charles Kaplan, the uh, North Museum of Gaming History uh, uh, Chairman, awarded Bob the Chairman's uh, uh, Award for the good work that he's been doing. So I pleasure you. And so Bob is a great guy. So welcome, Bob. All right, thank you. Morning, everybody. Morning. Morning. Um, okay. I uh, started like them a little over 15 years ago. I've been primarily <coughs> slot cards after starting with everything like everybody else does. I wound up honing in on slot cards. Um, I really got serious around 2010 when Pat Lamb decided to retire from collecting. Um, if you remember, Pat was the one, the original author of the slot car guy, along with Steve Wells. And uh, I actually acquired her collection when she retired, and part of the deal was I would keep the slot car guy going. So uh, the picture on the left is my main collection. It's about 97,000 cards. Um, the picture on the right is my doubles, about 200,000 cards currently. And it, I've acquired about 45 collections over the last 10 years trying to preserve some of the rare things as people retire or pass away. Okay, so slot cards, uh, before slot cards, you had check cashing privilege cards, <coughs> VIP cards, and other kinds of things for high rollers to recognize them and give them special permissions. And then uh, Golden Nugget Casinos in Atlantic City and Las Vegas started out with a slot card program that used um, tickets. They were Spent on one dollar machines like the ski ball machines, uh, and then the Frontier would have, would, was rumored to have a, a track uh, tracking program in the 70s. Um, nothing like we have today, but that was an early start. First manufactured cards for tracking games was the Sands in Lang City in 1982, and then later in 1985, Harris Marina again in Lang City had the full online tracking system, the more like we have today. Now, if you want to look at the history of slot cards, there's a really good article in an older copy of the Casino Chip and Token News from 2001. It was their July, August, September issue. So this picture shows some of the early tickets that were used. The two upper left ones were from Golden Nugget, and all the rest were from Harris and Reno and Tahoe. Okay, so in the early days, there were paper cards. And some of them were laminated, if you're lucky. Um, then they started using barcodes. Um, in the early days, it was just a sticker attached to the card. Um, then uh, later, they started actually printing the barcodes on the cards from the manufacturers. So the casino would get a stack of cards, they'd already be pre labeled with the barcodes and the numbers. Then they got into the punch cards with the punch holes, readers, and finally got to magnetic stripes like I had today. And contrary to what people think, there's not very much on that magnetic stripe. It's basically the name and number that you see printed on the front. Okay, there's, at, in the last few years, they've started experimenting with guard by heat tags, kind of like the keyless entry you have your car. Uh, it's a fob you just hold up to the machine and it locks you in, just like putting your car in the slot. And there's even been a few casinos that experimented with a, a, a cell phone app that, connects to Bluetooth and does basically the same thing. There's also, you'll see some very high-end um, engraved metal cards for really, really high rollers. Um, one good example is Railroad Pass. They have a custom metallic card that's hand-produced for 
each recipient. And as far as I know, talking to the management there, there have been less than 10 that have been issued. Wow. I couldn't even get a picture of one for the guys. <laughs> <laughs> and he promised me he'd give me a picture whenever they got another one, and they haven't got one in the last two years. <laughs> so that's how ready they are. Um, <coughs> while we're here talking about the cards themselves, um, there's some confusion when you'll see some listings in the guys that talk about raised printing. When we talk about raised printing, we're not talking about the embossed numbers and names like you can see on a credit card. We're talking about it as a printing process that is used where it deposited ink on the surface and you can actually feel it with your fingers if you, if you move your hand across the card. So here's some examples. There's an Aladdin paper card that was up there. There's a Bull, Bull Durham's card that's actually player number one. Um, then you see the Pat Lamb's card with the Barclays that were printed from the print, print manufacturer. And the bottom one where they put a label on the back of some of the Colorado cards. The upper right is a punch card, and that happens to be the rarest slot card out there. That's the gold VIP from uh, Landmark. About uh, six years ago, I think, they sold for, one of those sold for $1,500 on eBay. <coughs> I've had two, and the last one I sold, the best I could do was 650 And there's a terrible ski file that you're experimenting with, and the bottom one is an engraved card from a poker room in Moscow. Okay, so once the casino gets their cards, uh, obviously they print your name and, and your player number. Could be embossed, could be printed, could be engraved. Um, a lot of casinos will add your picture to the card. Uh, it's usually high rollers, but now there's a few casinos that do it for everybody. Uh, a lot of poker rooms do it too. Then you'll see special prints. Um, most likely for seniors, to indicate the senior players. Um, you'll see punch holes, you'll see stickers, you'll see hot stampings, all kinds of variations that the casino do to add additional information to their card. Um, the one example is Isle of Capri will have an asterisk, or used to have an asterisk after the name for seniors. Um, Lady Luck would, would punch a card in the shape of a heart to indicate the seniors. Um, Nevada Palace has a hot stamp that will put a silver hot stamp on it with a silver circle. And you'll see a multitude of other stickers and, and things on the cards as well. Um, Foxwoods actually put an M or an F in front of the player hanger to indicate male or female players at one point. And there's a lot of other stickers out there. Um, you'll see stickers for expiration dates, um, different programs, different tournaments all kinds of things. Um, one thing to point out is that the just because a card has a particular sticker, it's not listed officially in the guides. Um, whether it's the chip guide or the software guide, it's it's the base card that comes from the manufacturer of the board. Um, the other thing you'll see is attached ribbons. There were a lot of casinos in the past that would lure a long ribbon on the card as well. So there's some examples, Lakeside they put pictures for everybody. The upper right says Silverado with the, the ribbon on it. Um, it's hard to see. The Dow one has an asterisk after the player on her name. Silverado actually printed the name senior. And then the, and the Lot of Palace is the one with the hot stamp. You can see the silver circle. And there's some other examples of other senior stickers. Okay. Uh, oh, uh, while on the subject of stickers, um, in the past, a lot of collectors um, would put a sticker on the back of the card to identify the issue or the date that they got it or whatever. Um, personally, I would highly recommend not doing that. After buying a lot of collections that have been around for a while, you clearly see that the glue will damage the cards over time. No matter how good a sticker you buy, whether it's supposed to be peeled or not, over time, when that glue starts to dry, it will etch into the card. If you do get a card with a sticker, uh, one trick that I've learned over the years is a plastic razor blade. Yes? The blue card up there, are those actually holes like the... the yes, yeah, that's, that's, that's a punch hole. That's it, okay. Because yeah. it looks like a Chad voting card. The, the, the bottom of the row of, of holes is a timing thing for the, for the sensors when you put it in. Um, 
Yeah. Uh, Sorry. You were saying plastic razor blade? Hmm? Plastic razor blade? They were yeah, no, okay. plastic razor, razor blades. They're used by uh, auto body shops for taking pinstripes and stickers off of cars. And they work beautiful for taking the stickers off of cars um, without damaging them. If, if it's really dry and etched in, it may take a little work to get it off, but eventually you can get it off. Does the alcohol work? No. Um, what works best is a thing called Google. Google on. It's an oil-based product. It dissolves the blue. And if so, if you can get the sticker off and there's blue residue, um, you put some Google on on a um, on like paper towel. Q-tip. Just saturate it, and you can eventually it'll dissolve and just wipe off. Once you get that, then you have to get the oil off. So what I usually use is a Windex wipe or some Windex on a paper towel. All works well. No matter what, I would take a microfiber towel and they're all done and make sure it gets it. Because you, you may not feel some of the glue, but the microfiber towel will take it off. Uh, so if you're going to collect, the thing is, what do you want to collect? I mean, do you want to collect every slot card that's ever been made? Or do you want to collect, do you want to collect um, a specific casino or a chain of casinos or a certain topic? Um, you know, it, it's it's up to you to limit, you know, like any other collection, what you want to do. Um, now, how do you want to organize the things? Just like any other collection, um, do you want to you want to organize them by the casino name or the type, like Riverboat Casinos, Indian Casinos, you know, Poker Rooms, whatever, or do you want to do something with rarity or, or, or whatever? Personally, I found over the years, I, I sort everything alphabetically by the casino name. It makes it easy to find things. But I did separate the rare from the, the common, so I used two different storage methods for that. Uh, what I mentioned here was for stories, um, Commonly in the past have been three grain binders with storage pages. Um, if you do that, you want to make sure that the pages are archival quality. Otherwise, the, the cards will stick over time. And a lot of the pages that are real rubbery, those are terrible. The, the, those will really stick to the card. There's two types of cards that can be used. Um, the business cards are a perfect fit for the slot cards. Uh, the only thing is you can't do anything to protect the card. It just slides into the slot and it might be a little hard to get out sometimes. If you use baseball card pages, um, you get less cards on the page, but you have a little more room, so you put the card into the sleeve and then slide it into the page. You can actually put multiple cards in the slot if you do that. I've seen that done too. Uh, and that also gives you a way to store some eyeball sizes. Um, there are some oversized cards and you know, other little other um, So there's a standard size for the cards? Yeah, it's, the, most slot cards are a standard credit card size. I mean, 99% of them. Um, there's a few in the past that were oddball sizes, like the Maxim and a couple others. Um, but the, for the majority, they're, they're pretty, pretty good size. <coughs> um, I mentioned plastic sleeves. But there's a couple different manufacturers that make them. There's, there's a number that are the size, exact size of credit card to slip them in, peel off the slips covering from the glue and slot it over and it protects everything. Um, you can also use a baseball card. They make sleeves as well. Are those sleeves, will they adequately protect, are they, I think you used the archival? Yeah, the archival. They, they are, are uh, Yeah, so you, you should check that you do, but most of the ones I've seen you can buy are. Okay. I actually have custom sleeves made that I use, and I have some with me if anybody wants to take a look. Um, that, the reason I had a custom made one is that I put the glue on the back of the envelope side. So when you open up the sleeve to take the part out, there's no glue on the sleeve on the, on the end of the sleeve. Um, and again, when I was talking about stickers, if you want to put stickers on to identify, if you have a sleeve, it's real easy. You just put it on the back of the sleeve and you're not going to hurt the car. Or you put it on the on the, uh, the three-ring binder page you know, on the back of the car there. So here's a couple of different examples. So you see the, the upper left is the standard business card where you can get 10 on a page. The next one is a, is a uh, baseball card. So you get nine per page. The other thing I use is the, the standard boxes, the baseball card boxes. Uh, that allows you to put the card in. If you're using the standard sleeve or baseball card sleeve, you can still put it in the box. It's protected. Um, that, that really helps you have older cards where the lamination starts to peel wherever the sleeve will keep it intact. 
keep it moving around. It also protects them if you're, if you're actively going through your cards every once in a while, it keeps them from scratching them and you know, sliding against each other. BCW makes the biggest supply of, of those uh, boxes. Uh, the ones I use are the eight, what they call an 800 pound baseball card box that holds a little over 300 slot cards. The one below it is um, what they call their super, super monster baseball card box. And it's supposed to hold 5,000, uh, no, it's, yeah, it's supposed to hold 5,000 baseball cards. It holds about 2,500 slot cards. The trouble is they're vertical, so they're a little hard to go through. Is it real heavy too? Oh yeah, yeah. They're, they're like 25 to 40 pounds of right. baseball cards. <laughs> so if you saw the first picture, I had them on wire racks and I had to stick with um, three foot wide racks. If I, I went to six foot and it bent the racks. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they, they, they actually said that the, the, the shelves were supposed to hold 300 pounds, but they didn't. <laughs> um, and the bottom left shows a lot of the Googie one. You get that at any uh, supermarket. Next things and there's the, the plastic scrapers. You get them cheap on Amazon. You can get a pack of ten with a, with a handle for five or six bucks, or a whole box of blades for about ten bucks, a hundred blades. And then the sleeves are there's a picture of the sleeves I use right there. Okay, um, so let's go on to the, the guide itself. Um, it was originally published with Steve Wells, and then Pat Lamb took over right pretty close to the beginning. It was originally titled the Slot Card Price Guide, but I renamed it just the Slot Card Guide because it's more interested in just the cards themselves. Uh, first edition was 2001, um, it was roughly 100 pages. The last edition that Pat did was the seventh edition. At that time, there were a little over 10,000 cards listed. Um, she published every two years on paper and a CD ROM on a Microsoft Word version. Um, she actually manually created the index at the, at the end of the book every time she published. Um, it took her almost two weeks to, to generate the release. So I took over in 2010. The first thing I did was just recheck everything and, and kind of clean up the documents. So I made the index an automatic thing. I, I standardized all the fonts and the spacing and all that kind of stuff. So it made it a lot easier for me to maintain. Uh, I added some appendix at the back so it shows player number prefixes because at the time there were a lot of players that were collecting the different prefixes like Harris, the first three digits of the player number would tell you where that person signed up for the card. Um, so a lot of people were collecting that on the different issue cards. Um, I published the eighth and ninth editions in 2011, 2013, basically on the same schedule she was doing, printing copies with CDs also. And um, it was a task. I, I basically broke even on the first one and I lost on the second issue. <laughs> so after that, um, and because of another reason we'll talk about in a few minutes, um, I decided to completely reorganize the guide for a number of reasons. I changed it to an all digital format and with free downloads. And I just put a note that I would appreciate donations towards the expenses. And it's, it's covered most of the expenses for web hosting and whatnot. I did the first release that in 2015. And now uh, I do releases every three months to try to <coughs> come up with changes. Um, so I leave it up to you guys if you really want or need you know, to be that current, you can. If not, you can skip and download when you need it. It's always there. And I've kept all the, the previous releases on the Slackberg Guide website, so you can access all of those. Um, and part of the donations that I do get, I split with David Sprague to help cover the cost for the Slackberg DDS. Um, the other thing I did too was, um, it's also available in Acrobat, Adobe Acrobat format, so that if you didn't have Microsoft Word, you can pretty much use it anywhere. And even on a cell phone, you use it sometimes on a cell phone itself. Um, uh, one other thing that I did do um, recently was I got permission from Jim Munding, who published a book back in 2004 on Mississippi slot cards. 
and I was given permission by him to digitize that book and um, make it available for historical information. So that's available on the Slapper Guy website as well. Okay, so part of this reorganization was um, the original organization was too confusing for new collectors. Um, the way the patent and, and Steve did it was to list all the Las Vegas stuff together, all Laughlin together, all small cities in Vegas, I mean in Nevada, and then they had Canada in with the farm cards, and they had all the riverboats listed together, all the Indians listed together, and it just got so confusing for somebody new that didn't know the difference. And a lot of the riverboats were becoming land-based, and it just made things more and more confusing. So what, we, what I did was list all of the casinos alphabetically by the casino name within each state, and all the different types of casinos lumped together. But I kept an indicator under the casino name of the guy that if it was a riverboat or Indian, whatever, you would still have that information, although they wouldn't be lumped together. And I also created a, a separate section for the Canadian casinos since we're getting more and more of that type of stuff. Uh, so I made that kind of like the United States where I have the provinces listed now and all the casinos listed under each province. Also expanded the table of contents now to cover all the new, new sections that were, that were done. And I instigated a new numbering guide um, for the guide, our numbering system for the guide as well. Um, now what I do is it'll be a new edition at the first of the year. And then as I do the quarterly updates, it'll be like a 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. So the latest edition is a 16.1 that came out in April. The other thing I did was I started color coding the changes I do in each quarter. And each quarter is a different color and it's compounded through the year. So you'll see all the changes for the first quarter in red, the next one in blue, the next one in purple, whatever it is, and then reset it when it comes time. So you see, have more and more historical information that way you can see what the changes were. Okay. Now the other reason for the reorganization was I was asked to start integrating the slot card guide with the chip guide. Um, at the time, they were just starting to start posting other items besides chips, and they were starting to get some slot cards, and it was they needed some organization. So they asked me to do that. Part of the deal was that I could link to all the images that we put up through this, this slot card guide. So um, as we started to put the images up on the chip guide, um, as a CG number was assigned to each slot card, it was entered into the slot card guide. So that's how we kept track of what, what we'd done and where we were. And each of those CG numbers, as you see them in the slot card black guide, later when we look at it, is a hot link. So if you have your computer with an internet connection, you click on that CG number, it will bring up the, the images for that card from the slot from the chip guide. So that was one of the many features that we had, Charles had to implement to get this all to work. Uh, at the same time I did that, I added hot links for the casino names themselves. So if you click on a casino name in the slot card guide, it will bring up everything that's listed on that on the chip guide for that casino. So an instant access from one guide to the other. I did the same thing for the, the states, provinces, and countries. If you click on those, it will bring up the casino list for that, that area. So I originally worked with a number of admins. Uh, I was keeping two or three admins going at a time with scanning all the cards, and giving them the information to post it, and they would go off and do their posting thing. And, and then I would double check them when they were done. I had two or three other slot card uh, collectors, Tom Dunn and uh, Lee Knopf, were helping for a while with doing some cards from their area. But um, they kind of fizzled out. I, I did the bulk of it. Um, but I have to give special thanks to the scout, Alex Scalzo, for helping me um, learning how the, this all worked and, and figuring out how to handle a lot of special issues that came up along the way that we learned as we got further and further into it. And, and a lot of thanks to Charles for all the guidance he gave and uh, the things that he implemented to, to, to make this all work. So somewhere along the way in April of 2016, I actually wound up being an admin myself on the 
just died. And I started handling the, um, the slot board entries myself. Uh, we had pretty much got through the major bulk of things. We were down to the final things that were kind of touchy and we had a lot of problems trying to figure out how to make it work. Uh, Rob, um, from the editor of the, of the magazine, he helped, uh, Rob McPherson, he helped uh, quite a bit too, especially the Canadian stuff. So we completed that integration in 2017. It took two years to get uh, over 22,000 submissions up. Um, so what happens now that I'm an admin, if, if you submit a slot card entry to the chip guy, I will get an immediate, immediate email that, of the submission and it will be automatically set aside that it's in process so the other admins don't have to worry about it. And I'll get to a use of it in a day or two. Um, when I post that on the chip guide, it also goes into the slot card guide and make sure they're linked together. And I also, if it's a US card, I'll usually post something on the slot card BBS to let people know that um, what's being done, or what's been added. Okay. So the latest release was in April. 16.1, we're now over 23,600 cards. Wow. It's over 520 pages in length, double column, pretty tight text. <laughs> uh, there's no way this document could include images, so this idea of linking it with the chip guide was a perfect solution. It's over, over 520 pages. We seem to average about 1,000 new cards a year in a normal year. Last year was Obviously not normal, so there weren't that many. But all of a sudden, it seemed like everybody's trying to catch up. <laughs> there was a ton of submissions this this quarter. Next release will be July 1st. Um, so I get home and get, get caught up on things. Um, so that'll be coming out soon. I got a question when <clears throat> you were talking about not many cards being published last year. Mm -hmm. Is they going to be worth more than we'll say? 2019. You know what I'm asking? Because yeah. The, the, the quantity isn't out there. And the, the, the thing is that the cards that were out last year were the cards that had been out for the year before. They, they just didn't change things much because they were closing or they were limited, limited use, so they didn't buy new cards. So I don't think it'll really affect anything that much. Hmm. Um, there weren't any special cards made for that year for like COVID or anything that I know of. There, well, there were, there were sort of a couple. And those are worth a little bit more than, than the, the average card. Um, I think there were a couple in Colorado that actually were something that mentioned COVID on them. I don't think, I don't think that was more than five or 10 and, and worldwide. Um, Thank you. Else? Anything else? Um, <coughs> So when we get to the, the guide, um, for each casino, it'll include the, the casino name and the location, um, the years it was open and closed. Um, Pat, when she did it originally, she tried to list when the slot program opened and closed, but it got too hard to really do that, so we just went with the open and closed days. Um, there might be some notes on the ownership changes or additional information in the you know, special to that, to that casino. Um, and then the indicators I talked about that uh, will be in there to, to tell you whether it's an Indian or overboat or and that kind of thing. And then you'll see the slot cards and listed along with some special items that anything that's related to um, earning rewards basically will try to be included. Um, there might be some table cards in there um, and some other things. Um, the one unique thing is everything's tried to be listed in issue order um, to try to get a sense of how old or newer it might be. Um, so, okay. Okay, so we, the one thing I try to do is um, I try not to change these issue orders a lot of people will document that in their collection. Um, so if I find, happen to find an older card that needs to be inserted in the middle of the sequence somewhere, you might see something like an 8A, 8B. 
so I can preserve the, the number of symptoms. Um, if it gets to the point where it's just totally confusing to try to do anything else but renumber, then I might bite the bullet and renumber. Um, if I do something like that, there's usually a note at the front of like the special release. Um, let's see. Is While we're on the issue numbers, um, the issue numbers are normally like one, two, three, four. Um, special cards will have an XX indicator. Um, table cards have a TC and that sort of thing. Um, there's so, special cards that are used in like Win and Encore and a few others where they're more of a property ID. They, they can be used as a room key, they can be used as your slot card on the floor. Um, there's a couple other casinos that do that. Uh, so I, use, I implemented a, a new ID for that in the slot card guide, just using an ID with a number behind it. Um, we did something similar with cruise ships. Cruise ships, um, at one point, the cards were used for everything as a passenger ID, and it was your boarding pass, your room key, and it was used in an onboard casino. Uh, so those cards, you can implement a new uh, ID with a CS for its cruise ship, and then a number after it. And then if the cruise ship had a special slot card, uh, we'd use the normal card number for that. Uh, then it would put those the predominant colors. Um, usually it's the major color of the, of the front of the card. If, uh, if it might be like a white card with a blue band for a level, uh, we might do you know, like a white slack blue. Or, uh, then there'll be some kind of, uh, there's a field for description. It'll be a sh very short text description. And it's usually um, like the name of the program or you know, whatever is predominant on the card to identify it. And try to point out like one thing that makes it easiest to find that card or identify it. There might be ten things that change from the last card. We try to pick the biggest thing that's easiest to find. Um, some of those descriptions may be cumulative, like we might say it added this to the card, or, it, or this is no longer listed, that kind of thing. So you might see that as well. Um, then there's the manufacturer mark, um, which identifies uh, usually if, if the manufacturer puts a mark on the back of the card, like PPC for plastic print cards, ABL for ABLE, ACC. Um, there's a number of others. The latest ones are PLI cards, and they'll also have a, a batch number, a word number, as well as the, the PL, their name on the card. So the guy will try to list that to identify the card, make it easier to list. One thing we just changed on the chip guide was we were originally putting that information on the PLI card and, and the batch number all in the manufacturer field, and it got to be a little confusing. So we decided to move the batch numbers and manufacturer numbers to the uh, catalog field, catalog number field on the chip guide, and just keep the manufacturer name for the MTNFTR field. Uh, and then you'll see a, a rarity column. Um, which tries to identify whether it's something, you know, from common to extra rare, and also a, a price or value, which is usually a rough guess on uh, you know, what the market was doing and, and you know, how hard it was to get, and how many were made, how many would survive. Um, the numbers are, are not really changed too much once they're entered. Um, it's tough to, to do that with 20 some thousand cards. Uh, so it's more of a guide. I mean, the ultimate price is the value between the buyer and the seller. Um, but this would give you a starting point. Right now, rare cards are selling for about 40 to 50 percent of what's listed in the guide as an average. But that fluctuates over time too. And then you'll see a checkbox again if you, if you want to use the guide as a you know a way to track what you have in them. And then the CG number, as I mentioned before, is at the end. Uh, one thing I should mention is the CG numbers in the chip guide are actually entered manually for everything. So if you get one, you click one that doesn't seem to work right or is wrong, let them know and I'll fix it. Um, you know, for the most part, they seem to be okay, but every once in a while, come across one. Or if something changes on the chip guide. Yeah. How many manufacturers do you think there are? How many what? Manufacturers. Uh, and, and do they let you have access to their, you know? No, they don't. <laughs> But there are probably, um, I guess on the order, maybe 10 different manufacturers. I mean, it's not a real one. Though, although when you get into foreign cars, you find a lot of oddball things that we don't normally see. Um, uh, like 
Mycosyl Permianus or whatever it is in Mexico, they make a lot of their cars, and there's a, a couple of companies in Europe that make a lot of parts for European consumers. So it's probably 10 to 20 different ones. It's like I'm an admin too, and, I, and I'm trying to, you know, yeah. get some of these, you know, Sprague, you know, owns Chipco, and, yeah. and he keeps telling me I keep bugging him, you know. <laughs> for the records, and he's like, well, I, every time I tell them it, I didn't get what they told me I would. Yeah. Well, that doesn't help me. Give me what you got. I have enough troubles talking to the casinos. Like, I've, I've been trying to get the prefix number information from Boyd, and I keep leaving messages and calling, and nobody will get back to me. Yeah, that's the and same thing I'm running. It's just through. crazy. Yeah. Um, but Harris, like, they gave me a property list uh, with all the prefixes, and the only stipulation was I wasn't allowed to publish that list that they gave me, but I could publish the numbers as they appear. So as, as people find a new prefix, I can tell, oh yeah, that's from there. But I can't just publish the whole list that I got. And there was a guy in California right now who just found like three or four new prefixes. And he actually came across one. I don't know what it is. I'll have to see what track it down. Wow. OK, so. Um, I guess it's a good point to take a look at things now. Um, just to get it up. This is a little hard to read, but this is the, the slot card guide, the current edition. This is the word format. If I bring up the PDF, you'll see it's pretty much the same layout. Everything is identical. Um, the, the only one difference between the two copies, well, let me get this first. This, you should look at the front and see acknowledgements. So there'll be an introductory section. There'll be um, a description of what's included. Basically, all the things we've gone over and how to use the guide and, and all the different the explanations of all the different sections. <coughs> and this is important notes for this edition will be here and it'll be color coded to match the editions of what's been done. And mainly, this is where I, I point out some major, major change where I had to completely renumber some casino or I had to move it or do something different that I couldn't explain at, at where it appears. So it's a good place to check to see what's, what's changed in the main edition. This, the one big difference between this and the PDF is in the Word format, these numbers are actually clickable links. I could click on that page number and it would jump to the page in the Word version. In the, a PDF file can. So this is the expanded table of contents now. List all the states, the Canadian provinces. You also see this um, miscellaneous cards. There's a few um, uh, manufacturer cards that were documented over time, um, and a few, and that's where the crucial cards <coughs> are. And you also see the multi-property or universal cards. This is where, like the Harris or Caesars, um, where they're using you know, 20, 30, 40 properties. They're all listed in one common place. This will mirror what's on the chip guide too. We have um, a manufacturer, uh, uh, casino management, I guess they call it on the, on the chip guide, where you'll see like Harris or Caesars listed there, and then all the different casinos will have a link to it. All the foreign casinos, and then there's a couple of appendix for the, the player number prefixes. You'll see I actually decoded the the barcodes are used in Montana for their player cards, so I can identify the casino by the barcode as well. And there's some hints in there on how to try to track down a Russian card. Because the acrylic language is, is really a top job. <laughs> so there's a way that you can see images quickly on the chip guide of all the Russian cards and kind of match up pictures. Anyway, this is what the guide looks like. Uh, it's, like I said, it's pretty tight text, double column, even if I you know, expand this, it won't get any bigger. Um, but you'll see like casino name, location. You might see here where, where it's, um, it'll say Indian Casino on the Wind Creek. Um, over here in Quincy's, I don't say racetrack. So the, all the specialty casinos are listed. Although I didn't identify restricted license, I left them with very standard labels. And then you'll see the, the issues and the issue order. You'll see the, the text with the color and the text from the car. Um, if the manufacturer is not saying anything special, see none. Um, let's see if I go to another page. This one has, you'll see manufacturers the ABL for ABLE. PG, uh, they have the mark that's kind of overlaid PNG on the back of the car. Um, 
uh, PLI cards is, is more of the more recent cards, and most of those cards have a batch number on them too. So if, if it's a PLI card with both on it, the PLI card would be in the manufacturer field and the rest will be in the commons. Um, if there's no PLI on it, then it'll list the number in the manufacturer field. <coughs> it's the same space. And, and like I said, if you click along these CG numbers, you get this from the chip dot. So this was something that Charles implemented. It gives you both sides of the card. Um, typical image on the chip guide is 650 pixels wide for horizontal card. Seems to be um, about the best resolution to give you enough that you can read everything on the back of the card, but it's not too big. Um, and I think the chip guide will automatically resize submissions. If you, if you it does now. Yeah, yeah, it does now. In the past, I had to do all that. <laughs> okay, man, that's a rough job. Yeah. Uh, so let's see if I go down. Just want to go where I want. Okay. At the very end of, of this document, there's actually an index, but unfortunately the page numbers are not hot links yet. But it will give you an idea where in the guide something is if you look at it. Honestly, the best thing to do is if you hit Control F, it brings up a, a find box. And you know, if you just type in, I guess it would be more, let's say, uh, say how it is. It'll, it'll, you, you can jump directly to where you want to do a full search when you can see the name. One thing neat about Word is it gives you this um, search bar on the left, so you can, you can scroll through this and then pick something and jump to it quickly. Those are all arrows? Then. They're all arrows. Yeah, well, they're, they're, they're comments that have arrows in it. But one of these, oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, there's a, it's probably a bad example. There's a lot of those. Uh, yeah, if it's you, it gets, if, it's, if the names in the comments, the search will bring it up anywhere. So if you put in like South Point, will it get South Coast too? No, 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 no. It'll do. Can you read it? But it's South Point. It should go directly to it. So it doesn't bring up previous names? Or no, things. no. Now you'll see that over on the left, there's only two cell points, one in the index and one in the casinos. And like I said before, if you click on the south point, it'll give you that for south point. You get the casino listing. Now my profile is set up to give me slot cards only when I get up, obviously. Um, you know, it'll open up however yours is open up. But if it's not the, the subject you want, you can just collapse everything and then go open the one you want. It's pretty quick and easy. Um, basically, <coughs> so, um, State, the same with probably word province or country, you'll get the whole list. So there's a lot of kind of neat little things you can do between the two guys. So if you have a card, you know if you've narrowed down the casino, you can click on the, the casino name, get a list of all the pictures of all the slot cards, and you know you usually find it pretty quick. look at the chip guide listings uh, for slot cards, it kind of mirrors the slot card guide as best it can. Um, the cards are listed in the same sequence. 
parts that are ordered by issue. Um, the only difference is that the special issue parts may be slightly out of order because whoever did it originally, we had some issues with doing the special issue parts and they put them in however they could. I've been trying to clean up a lot of that as I see it, but for the most part, it's, it's not a major issue. Um, there's one thing that, that, that can happen too, is a card could actually be used with mobile casinos. You know, we know that Caesars and Harris, that there are multiple big numbers of casinos. But there's others that might only be listed in two or three casinos, like uh, Beyond the Point or uh, Ruddy and Butter. Um, those guys um, are listed. <coughs> what will happen is they'll be listed in both places in, this, in the, the both guides, since it's only two or three. On the chip guide, there'll be an extra entry under the, the slot card guide that'll say show casinos. And if you click on that, it'll bring up, um, let me show you what that looks like. So if I have Money Rudder and Beyond Point um, in the soccer guide, I list them all together. But if I go to one of these on the chip guide, you'll see this where it says Show Casinos. <coughs> and if you click that, that will tell you where it's used. Uh, the unique thing is that it's one CG number for the car. So even though it appears in multiple places, it's the same <coughs> listing, the same car. Two major issues used with the yellow band links. One other thing that, that you'll see is it, it gave me a convenient way to put a comment for a group of cards or to put a divider for a, a group of cards. So you can you can put that yellow band in without the hot line. All you do is put a dummy link in there, put it like an X. And you can insert a comment. So if I need to, de to, to delineate a certain group of cards or make a comment about it, it's an easy way to do it. And I talked before about the manufacturer versus the catalog fields that we, that we cleaned out. That was a change very recent in the last couple of weeks. I, I just went back and redid all the US slot cards and room keys to go to this new format. So the batch numbers are in the catalog on the field. Um, well, a couple other things that are pretty valuable in the chip guide, they're, they tr the admins try to put the, 
the flow of the casino name as ownership or name changes. Uh, because each time it changes ownership or changes name, it's listed as a new casino, basically. So there's a field there that like, it will tell you it was a certain casino and there'll be a link that you can click to go back to it. Or uh, a field that's, you know, what it became after it changed. And the open and close dates will usually track um, when it was that entity. Um, you'll also see typically a link to the casino website if they're still, still in business. So you can click on that and get to the, get to the uh, the casino website, there might be comments about the casino, especially on the farm casinos, about what they are or what they do. Um, you can use the ChipGuide user profile, like I mentioned, to, to limit what you see when you open up uh, the ChipGuide. Um, one of the things that's super handy is the, um, the ChipGuide casino search. If you've got a casino, you know where the hell it is, and, you, know, you, can, um, you can do the search. I got Charles to add the quote features to the search. So if you put quotes around something, it has to be an exact match. So otherwise you would get, like, if you search on casino, you get thousands of listings. And now if you do a search with the quotes, you can limit that search down quite a bit. And the trick I was talking about for uh, dealing Russian cards, let's see if I can find this. If you go to chip Guide query facility, and if you change the region to Europe, give it a second to update. Oh. There we go. Now you can select Russian Federation. And what type of what you're looking for, you go down here and select player remove cards and click query and what you get is a list of every Russian slot card that's out there and you've got a picture of front and back. So if you see one that matches or comes <coughs> close to what you're looking for, you can click the CG number, it'll tell you where it was. So it's a handy tool <laughs> with Russian stuff. Uh, if you're dealing with a lot of farm cards, there's a couple other tools. Um, Google Translate online, it comes out really handy. Oh yeah. Um, and what you, what you can do with that is, let me just go to home. With Google Translate, pick the language that you want. Like if I want it Russian. And you can, if this didn't come up, you can click here, you get the keyboard, and you'll have a keyboard in that language. So you can match the characters and kind of type it in, type it in the field deal and do it to translate to English. Uh, if you have an Android phone, Google Translate on an Android phone will actually do a real-time live translate in the picture. Where you, you take your camera over the image, and you have to download the, the, the packet for that language that you want to translate to make the camera work. But once you have that, you just camera over the car and it'll do a real-time translate of the text in your image. It might take a little fiddling around sometimes and if it's a weird font or uh, uh, italics it, it might have a little troubles with it but generally it works really well. So, so, so. It's a handy tool. Um, the other thing I did recently was I created a new website called the Slot Card Exchange. Um, I meant it to be a portal for resources for slot card collectors. Um, right now, uh, it's, it's, it's in the early stages. Uh, so it's basically, it gives you a link to the slot card guy website, it gives you a little information about the latest release. There's a, a link to the chip guy, a link to the slot card BBS where you see you can see the announcements on the individuals. Uh, a link to the chipboard um, and our club, club website, the MOVE website. There's also a link here called Colnet. Um, Colnet is another uh, collecting catalog site from Israel. It's similar to Chip Guide, but it's all collectibles, anything you can imagine. Um, if I bring that up, you would see this. 
And now you could go and look at their catalog by country, um, by what they call chain, which would be the name of the casino, um, by countries and regions, whatnot. Um, it's a limited catalog right now. They've got less than 3,000 slot cards, um, and their information is not always accurate. Um, the guy who's the, the admin for that section um, apparently does not like corrections. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> have, you, have you emailed? I've tried. Oh, and I see an e Yeah, because he's had some submissions where somebody mixed up the backs and fronts of cards, and I tried to help him correct it, and he just ignored me. So um, take it with a grain of salt, but it's out there. And they have some features where you can connect with other, other collectors. You can catalog what you have in your collection, kind of like what the chip guy is, and you can arrange trades and, and you know, purchases and sales. Um, <coughs> And I know some people in Europe that use this heavily, especially for room keys. That seems to be their big thing in, uh, in Europe. So that's another resource. Um, and I, I think that's about it. How many uh, collectors do you think there are in the US? It, it's dropped. Drop drastically. Most of the biggest collectors have either passed away or retired. Um, you know, Pat Lamb herself, Steve Wells. Uh, I, I've known at least a dozen collectors. That were big collectors I work with all the time. And they just suddenly decided to retire. There's still quite a few out there, and, I, and we're getting new new people interested. That's another reason why I made the Slapper Value free download is to try to generate more interest and get people into it. Do you have a counter? On, the, on your site, a daily counter, see how many people click on it every day? Mm, I know I have it. I, I mean, I have Google Analytics on it, um, and I probably get up to 100 hits a day. So, um, I mean, the chip guy's probably a better, better uh, idea of what's out there. Um, eBay has dropped drastically. It's, it's, you don't get bidding wars over cards very much anymore like you used to. I mean, four or five years ago, there would be 10, 20 people bidding on the same thing. Prices were sky high. And now you list something, you basically sell for what you list, or you sell for less if you make an offer on it. I mean, it, it, in the, when I first started collecting, the general rule was about a dollar a card if you bought a collection. Now it's more like 10 cents or 20 cents a card. I mean, it's, it's a shame. It's a shame. That chips are going down too. I, I yeah. probably got five thousand rare cards that I maybe sell, you know, a few every every couple of months. But right. it's not like it used to be. But we are getting new collectors into it. I've had you know, at least a dozen new guys to pick up on in the last few months. It is picking up. Anything else? In terms of. Uh, Slot cards versus room keys. Do collectors usually collect both, or just one or the other? Or there's both. It's they're they're both both fashion. There are people who collect one or the other, and there are people who collect both. Yeah. And um, for what it's worth, I just recently volunteered to do the room key submissions for each of as well. Um, what happened was I bought a collection from an estate. Um, John Billsmere passed away a year or two ago. Right? Or got in touch with my bought the collection. And he had about 6,000 room keys. So when I went through them to try to see what we needed on the guy, I started to have a really terrible time trying to, to just check things because it was so disorganized. So I wound up reorganizing what was there and then checking and adding. And then I talked to, to Charles and, uh, and Albert and, and said, you know, you really need somebody to do this. And it's like, well, do you want to do it? And it's like, okay. <laughs> and, uh, so, okay, you're so now I get the same emails if the slot card gets submitted, I'll look at that too. I mean, the room key. Um, so I can handle both. But it's, it's, the room keys aren't that bad. There's, it's not that active. You'll get batches of people travel. But uh, there's, there's one gentleman in Washington, East, in Washington State, Tom Don, who uh, before the COVID, he would take anywhere from two to four trips a year. He'd be gone for two to four weeks. And he, and it was all slot cards and room keys. So. And, and he would have hundreds of submissions. Yeah. And in terms of uh, new 
information, you just uh, you rely on people letting you know such and such is out here, or do you have any contacts with uh, player cards? I've tried to, to talk to casinos. I've, I've, I've sent emails to every casino in the world. I've tried everything I can think of to get them to help, and there doesn't seem to be an interest from their side. They don't seem to realize what it could do for them for very little effort. Um, I mean, like this guy Tom uh, done. I mean, if he found out that there was a new car in, in Kansas, he'd be gone. <laughs> it's it just, um, and there are other guys who are out there too that would go. And, and there was a guy in Missouri who would hit all the the in the Midwest. And, uh, yeah, it just. I did have one casino when they did. I forget the name of it now. But they did a. a They did a um, Elvis Presley special edition card, and they actually contacted me because somebody gave me the lead, and they gave me a whole set of cards. I put a little in the slot card BBS, it was in the guys, and they were thrilled with the reaction to that. Sure. Uh, but trying to get the other ones, it just doesn't seem to work. But by doing what we did with the, the, the integration of the two guides and making the guides free and all of that, um, it has helped get more interest. The big thing now is a lot of the chip guys mm -hmm. are submitting the slot card information too, even though they don't even collect them. They might see a new card and submit it. So we are getting probably two to three times as many submissions as we used to. Yeah. It's, oh. it's gaining it's steam. <laughs> yeah, it's gaining steam. Can you find that? Okay. Do you find that collectors prefer cards without a name on That's them? That's a big debate. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of guys that want blanks only, um, and there are other people that want to print it. Um, it. It doesn't seem to affect the value so much. Um, the big thing is that uh, a printed card proves it came from the slip. A blank card could have come from the manufacturer. We don't know. Um, one thing to be careful of is the uh, Montana cards, um, how barcodes on the back. And when the Montana casinos stopped using slot cards, um, there was one collector who went to the manufacturers and got all the remaining cards that were in stock. And those cards did not have a barcode on them, so they're considered samples because they came right from the manufacturer. So where a card that came from the casino might be worth $15, $20 because Fairly rare. Um, without the marker, it would be more like five dollars. Personally, I say both. <laughs> I'm, I'm the extreme. I, I see every possible variation I can find on every single card. I collect all the different player owner prefixes. It helps me with trying to determine the, the issue orders. Do you, for instance, Harris, I think, has like five levels now right and each one of them has an expiration date uh would you do you keep all five levels of every year forever actually i do and is there <laughs> is there a value if the card is identical for five straight years is the is first the, one more valuable than the fifth one not normally not normally okay not normally. It, it's more the level and, you know how how hard it is to get one of those cards. How many did they make? How many did they give out? How many the survived? Chinese New Year. How many That's survived? Hard to get. Yeah, yeah. The Chinese New Year's have been tough, especially the military ones or the local ones. The ones that have a local one. Uh, yeah. But I, I'm the extreme. I I, I do everything. It, it, one of the things, the, the main reason for doing what I do is it forces me when I buy a collection, I check every single card with my physical card. And that's how I find the Very things that were never collected, that never cataloged. And in, in reality, that's true. Like every class I, find, I go through, I find things that have it been cataloged, that slip through. And that's how we get them. Anything else? Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much.